It's no secret that real estate is one of the best investment vehicles out there. But with all the current uncertainty, how do we know when and where to put our hard-earned money to work for us? It's easy to become distracted by that shiny object or the quote-unquote next best thing. So how do we determine which strategies will best align with our financial goals? Whether you're an active real estate entrepreneur, a passive investor, or looking to get into real estate investing, our goal is to provide investors with the insights and strategies to build our portfolios all while protecting our capital. I'm Danny Nichols. And I'm Chris Thompson. This is the Two Smart Assets Real Estate Investing Podcast. Listen, if you're interested in passive real estate investing, but aren't sure how or where to get started, Our Passive Investing Guide walks you through the entire process from understanding the benefits to performing the due diligence. Download your copy today at twosmartassets.com and start taking action. What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to the show. I'm your host, Daniel Nichols, accompanied by our guest for the week, Jerome Myers. And today we are the Two Smart Assets. For those not yet familiar with Jerome, he is the founder of two different ventures, including Dreamcatchers, which is a boutique coaching firm that supports supports first and second generation wealth creators to self-actualize and attain transcendence. He's also the founder of the Myers Development Group, where he helps ordinary people invest in multifamily real estate in a way that creates generational wealth. Jerome, my man, it's great to see you. Welcome to the show. Danny, I'm so excited to be on with you today. I love the name of the show. (laughs) And hopefully we can just jump on and give the listeners something that they can dig into and Hopefully there'll be some transformation on the backside of this, man. So again, thank you for having me. Man, super excited to have you on the show. I have no doubt that our listeners are going to be able to take away a ton uh, away from this and uh, your words of wisdom. So super excited to share that with them. But, uh, you know, we always like to kiss, kick this thing off by hearing more about your story, the guest story, Jerome's story, right? So tell us more about your background, your story, and the path you took to get to where you're today, really in your in your investing career. Yeah, I like to sum it up with I'm just a corporate America dropout. So (laughs) my last job in in the matrix was building a $20 million division for a Fortune 550. I was employee number two in the division. It was January 13th. I still remember shaking the client's hand. And by September, we had 175 people on my team. Imagine that rocket ship of growth, making a bunch of new leaders, figuring out all the systems and processes to make the thing go. And then I get a phone call. It's 4.55 on December 24th. says, hey, Jerome, you and I have been going back and forth about this decision. And I know where you are, but let me tell you where we are. And so you're going to have to lay half of them off. Now, I said you, somebody else can do it for you. But it's kind of like kickball in elementary school. You can pick your team or somebody else can pick them for you. And so, you know. You need to mull this over and think about how you want to move forward. And I went into my rebuttal because <laughs> this is not the right decision. These folks have put their lives on hold as far as getting married or moving because we had some folks who were tied to the military on our team and so on and so forth. And I was like, Jerome, this is not a discussion. I'm telling you what we're doing. And I come back with my second rebuttal and I'm going to make a great case and Make sure that we don't make this terrible decision. And then the response is, Jerome, is 459. I'm going to spend the rest of the year with my family. I will talk to you in the new year. And then if you have an iPhone, the infamous three beeps, boop, boop, boop. And I look at the phone and I realize that the call was ended, right? And so what do you do? Because I'd never been the person that told people that they had to go find another way to make a living. What do you do when... You believe that you have the right people and you believe that your group is going to grow and you need those resources. And you look at the ledger and you see that you made 30 percent profit margins for your company that year, but you're still laying people off. What do you do? And so what did I do? I didn't eat. I didn't sleep. I decided that I wasn't going to celebrate the holidays anymore because it just ruined it for me. It's like, well, if this is happening here and we had a good year. What happens everywhere else? And there's just this reminder that somebody's being laid off at this time of year every time. And so after I got over my feelings and said, all right, we're going to get back into this thing. And we put Humpty Dumpty back together again. We're ready to rock and roll. It's February. And the rally cry. Here's what we're doing this year. Yeah, we lost some good people, but it's okay because you're still here because you were a top performer. 
And then I stand up in front of the room two days before Thanksgiving of the same year, this is 2016, say, hey, guys, you know, I, I got a weird feeling. Don't spend all your money on Black Friday. I just want to make sure we're good to go. And I knew then that once I made that statement, I was breaking a promise to myself. I realized that I was a part of the problem. I was part of the machine. I was a part of the mm. system that was grinding people up and spinning them out. And I didn't want to be. And the other thing that I finally realized is I had a choice. See, the first time around, Danny, I told people, well, they made me do it, right? I would never do that. that but I did do it. I, I was complicit. I participated. Even though I advocated, I, I participated in the process. And so I, I dropped out. And I went back and got this dream off the shelf that I put up there at the end of my sophomore year in college. Me and my buddy Duran were sitting on the stoop. And we were doing math because that's what engineering students do in the <laughs> free time. And I was like, I'm paying $3.95. I got two roommates doing the same thing. You're downstairs. You're doing the same thing. And he wanted to one up me. He was like, man, if, if we multiply that across the whole complex, this guy's making $700,000 a year. We've never seen him or talked to him. Like, oh, my goodness. We only need 70. Like, how do we do this? I'm the son of a soldier to stay at home mom. So nobody with a multimillion dollar real estate portfolio is coming to tell us how to make $60,000 a month by owning a complex. And, you know, and no way, shape or form did I understand the expenses and how the building actually right. operated at that point. But it was a really big number, right? I felt like I could just get away with 70. And so I grabbed that thing off the shelf. I broke it. I was like, okay, here we go. I'm going to do this, right? And I didn't know what I was doing, Danny. I'll be completely <laughs> honest. And so I went to the bank, the first bank, and I said, hey, I got money in the bank. I got a credit score. Don't you want to give me a million dollars to go buy this building? And he's like, yeah, no. Why would you do that? <laughs> he's like, well, I just built a $20 million business and I have P&L responsibilities. He's like, yeah, what else you got? I got an MBA. What else you got? I'm a licensed engineer. What else you got? Project management professional? What else? A six Sigma black belt. Yeah, we don't care about any of that. And I was crushed, right? It was like, I did all sure. the things. Like, what? Do you, are, of course you want to lend me money. It's mm -hmm. like, no, we don't. I said, well, what do you want? They said, we want somebody who's bought a property of similar size and executed the business plan that you're talking about doing. And I reached in my pocket and I pulled out some lint because I had nothing. <laughs> I had nothing for these folks. And so I was like, all right, you guys are just being stringent. You're, this is ludicrous. And so I'm going to go to the next bank. And the next bank told me the same thing. And so I did that eight more times. And they all told me the same answer. And so at that, that point, I realized I was beating my head against the wall, Danny. So I decided that I was going to fix and flip because that's what HGTV says real estate investing is. And, Absolutely. you know, maybe it just wasn't for me. I was shooting too high. You know, a, a kid that grew up where I grew up trying to buy an apartment building, that's just ridiculous. And so <laughs> I, I, I went and did that and started fixing and flipping. And I'm sitting on the stoop of this 1920s build, $90,000 rehab. And I am getting there at five o'clock in the morning. I'm leaving after nine o'clock at night. It is just a disaster. I mean, it's a total <laughs> cluster. We're doing everything, right? And a guy pulls up in a white Dodge Ram. He pops out. He's like, hey, bud, let me check out your finishes. I'm doing this building down the street and I want to make sure that we're going to be able to be comparable with what's on the market. And I said, mm. yeah, just poked out a little bit proud, right? Cause somebody wanted to see what we're doing. He For walks sure. in, he's like, Oh, you took the wall out and you got the gooseneck sink in the Island and look at this granite. Oh my goodness. We go upstairs. I show him the bathrooms. So I was like, yeah, we added this half bath on the backside. Cause you know, these old houses only have one bathroom. So we're coming back downstairs He's walking and getting ready to walk out. He stops in the threshold. He says, hey, man, what's up? You know anything about that building behind the Chimbo Mart? The 23-unit apartment building? <laughs> yeah, that one, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like, yeah, I tried to buy that four or five months ago, but the banks told me I need an experience partner. He said, really? Well, I'm going to make an offer on that later today. You are? Yeah. So you already own apartments then, huh? Yeah, we own a few things. He looked away like, yeah. oh, boy, here it comes. <laughs> like, dude, don't leave me out. You're the guy I've been looking for. The banks told me I need somebody with the spirit. You're the guy that I've been looking for because I didn't know anybody else in on apartments. He was like, 
What you gonna bring to the table? I looked away. I was like, I don't know, man. We'll figure that out. Just don't leave me out the deal. <laughs> I've been looking for you. Like, this is divine intervention. And he's like, sure. Yeah, but what are you gonna bring to the table? I was like, dude. I don't know. I tried to buy that deal four or five months ago. It looks like you want to buy it. Let's do the deal. And he got frustrated, shook his head, looked away. And he sighed. And then he said, hey, man, what are you going to bring to the deal? I said, dude, I don't know. We'll figure it out. And he shook his head one more time, turned around, walked down the stairs, through the grass, hopped in his truck and drove off. And I'm like, all right, we're doing this thing right now. It's about to happen. And this was on a Wednesday. So I was like, he's, he's going to call me in the morning and tell me he's got it under contract. Nothing. Friday come and goes. Nothing. I was like, all right, well, maybe they were negotiating. He just, he needs to negotiate through the weekend. Monday is the day. Danny, he didn't call me on Monday. <laughs> he didn't call me on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, or Friday. And I'm sitting on the stoop at this house thinking, what's going on? What did I do wrong? And I realized I didn't give him my phone number. Oh, <laughs> so man. he could have called me if he wanted to. Right. And so we get to the end of the row, right? And I'm like, oh, I, I guess this is over. I'm, I ruined it. I missed it. And then the next Tuesday, a guy called me who I used to lend money to when I was in corporate. And he said, so I got the opportunity to be the GC on that apartment deal you were talking about four or five months no ago. No way. I was like, what? He's like, yeah. But I told him I was only interested in doing it if you were involved. I was like, <gasps> Yes. I was like, when's the meeting? Right. And we, we have the first meeting. So it's the three of us. And then we bring in the broker and the property manager. And so we do the deal, right? $1.3 million in Richmond, Virginia, behind the Chimbo Mart. And uh, I end up in the seat of asset manager, kind of putting it together. So the reason why I tell that long drawn out story, man, is because I didn't do a good job of articulating the value that I could attribute to the deal sure. to a potential partner. Mm -hmm. And I don't want anybody to miss that, right? This isn't favor season. It's a business partnership. And if you can't articulate the value proposition that you have for somebody partnering with you, you can rest assured that they're not going to partner with you. And it's not because they're a mean person. Hey, people right. don't do business with people just because they like them. There's a whole lot of other things that go into that. And so anyway, I, I end up as asset manager in that deal and my name's in the paper. And so once your name's in the paper for closing a real estate project, then loan officers call you mm. because they want to know if you can refinance or what else you got in a pipeline. I didn't even know what a pipeline was. <laughs> so we get through all of that. Right. And somebody says, well, we want to take you to lunch so we can show you our products. You got products at the bank? Oh, okay. Well, we formed relationships. I came down here to Greensboro, North Carolina. We built a portfolio here and we've just been rocking and rolling, man. I am really excited what's happened. And I guess over the past, I'll call it 18 months, I've really doubled down on what my true calling is. And so there's a lot of coaches, right? Everybody's a coach these days. And I was embarrassed to say I'm a coach. But because it felt better to say I'm a real estate investor. Yeah. And so what, what I've finally accepted, though, Danny, is that I am a coach um, and I believe I'm one of the best coaches in the country. And I happen to have expertise in multifamily investing. And so for the folks who are out there and they're considering coaches and they're thinking, well, who do I hire? Do I hire the mindset guy or the guy that's got the mentorship program who's going to bring me in the community and help me get the thing? I'm telling you that you don't have to pick. There are people out there who do both. I run my portfolio. I'm the asset manager on every deal that I'm in. And I help people figure out how to grow and scale their businesses or their side business or whatever else they may be into. Really spent a lot of time focusing on people in financial services, right? So people sure. who place some money in syndications, running their own real estate portfolios, and then you know financial advisors. Because I believe when... People are placing money in these deals. That is extremely important that they're getting counsel instead of somebody's opinion. Yeah. You know, you make a lot of great points there. And, and you know, I love your story. Your story is, is perfect, man. And it's just, it, you're absolutely spot on too. If you don't know how you're going to bring value to somebody else, how are they going to know? Right. I mean, they're, you can't just have them putting on additional work for them to find value for you to add, right. You're going to need to bring it yourself. So I think that's, that's a great point, man. I love hearing that. And one thing uh, that I also heard in your bio and, you know, just kind of a preface this, you know, I've been following your content and stuff you put on social media for a long time, man. And it's, it's great stuff, man. I, I 
really like seeing that. And by the way, for our listeners who are listening to the show right now, go follow Jerome. Go right after you listen to this episode, go follow Jerome. He's putting out fire. Make sure to go do that uh, as soon as this episode is over. But I've been following you for a while and a recurring theme in your message and stuff I've heard you on other podcasts talk about is, and something even you just mentioned here in the in the, the beginning is the matrix, you know, and the idea of taking the red pill, man. And, you know, I think it's so interesting. And, you know, obviously there might be some Keanu Reeves fans out there like, oh, I love that movie. But, you know, we're, kind of, we're not really talking about that maybe a little bit, not really, you know, can you talk to us about what that is and how that applies to you and the people in your circle? Yeah. And I mean, I think it's for everybody. And so if you didn't watch the 1999 documentary called The Matrix, then you probably should go see it because it's going to challenge the status quo. And then even the the episode, I don't even the I don't volume, whatever you want to call it, right? The sequel, the sequel is the word that I'm searching for that came out on December 22nd of 2021. It challenges the way that you see the world. And for me, most of us are programmed and we don't ever take the time to figure out what is things that we actually believe. And so we continue to do things because of tradition, right? For instance, what are you talking about? Crazy guy. Okay. If I sneeze right now, 99% of you are going to say, bless you. But why? Oh, because it's polite. Yeah, but where did it start or why did it start? Mm. Oh, I don't know. Well, it, people used to believe that when you sneeze, your heart stopped. And that if you continue to live afterwards, then the God, God restarted your heart. And that's why you need to be blessed. Or you were blessed. And he blessed you. So, you know, when, when you start thinking about simple things like that, but let's go deeper. Like, why do you practice the religion you practice? Why do you earn the living the way that you earn it? Why do you have the car that you drive? Why do you live in the home that like all of these decisions that you think you made a choice on? You probably didn't. You were probably taught to do things a certain way or a specific way simply for somebody else to have the ease of controlling you. What are you talking about, Jerome? Well, if you're in corporate America and you put your money in a 401k, the only way that you get access to that money is if you take a heavy, heavy penalty or you wait until you're over 59 and a half in order to start withdrawing from it. So what does that do? It forces you to have a job for the 40 years so that the machine continues to burn and churn. Is that okay? For some people it is, but did you make a deliberate decision that that's the way you wanted your life to turn out? If you did, amazing, Mazel tov, continue your journey. If you didn't and you're looking at your phone or you're looking at your computer or you're looking around to see if anybody's watching your reaction right now, it's an opportunity for you to press pause and say, what can I do to create cash flow for me right now so that I don't have to pile up a big nest egg so that I can actually hope that my money doesn't run out one day when I get the opportunity to retire. Like that is like mega or, you know, that's macro and the bless you is micro. And I think everybody goes through that. And so Danny, I went through a really tough time back in 2010 when I had what I self-diagnosis, postpartum depression, right? And I started questioning everything from religion to how I looked to you name it. I remember I, w- I was the guy, I was a corporate guy, man. I had a short haircut, no hair on my face, ready to go because I wanted to run a business unit at this 17,000 employee, uh, Fortune 500, maybe Fortune 100 company. And when I had a conversation with my mentor one day, it's like, man, I can't wait till I get your age so that I can grow my hair and be able to do whatever I want to do. And then realizing, well, what am I waiting for? Right? Like, why not do it now? And when I made that pivot, all the people who saw me going through that transition were like, you're crazy. What are you <laughs> doing? I'll never forget. I stopped getting haircuts in May of 2010. And my supervisor at the time, maybe he was my boss's boss. He was like, man, what's up with the crazy hair? I was like, I don't think it's crazy. And he's like, oh, okay. Is that what you're doing? I was like, yep, that's what I'm doing. And 
over the course of the next three years, I doubled the income I was making Wow! by just being true and showing up in an authentic way and making some choices that I probably wouldn't have made had I stayed in that box. And so it's, it's my ambition to inspire people to take the limitations off of them that they have, even if they are unaware that they're on them. And so that's what the matrix is, man. It's just a totally different way of seeing the world and then acting in accordance with that understanding that there is an alternative to what is often presented to us as reality. Yeah. And I think you make a great point with that, man, because really, you know, a lot of us are just going through the motions, right? That's just, that's just kind of how it is. We, this is how we perceive life to be or how life should be, right? Because maybe we're taught that way, or maybe we see our parents do it that way or somebody else doing that that way, right? The majority of people. And so like, oh, this is normal. This is how it's done. And you go on about your day and then that day turns into weeks and then months and then years and then decades, right? And then before you know it, like you said, you're, you're withdrawing from your retirement account, right? And then what happened? What happened to my life? It's, it's, it's gone, right? It's basically, you know, I've missed uh, a lot of time there, but I think you bring up a lot of good stuff, man, especially about, you know, paying attention, reflecting on, you know, the decisions that you're actually making, what you're doing, the actions you take and how you perceive what's happening around you. And I think, I know I'm speaking for myself really is I know this, I'm guilty of this, right? This has happened to me and it still happens to me today in certain areas. Right. And so I think you bring up that point um, and to our listeners as well, be paying attention to these things because they're important, right? They're not just something you should just pass over, uh, um, you know, in your day to day, you should be considering these things and making sure they're aligning with how you want to design your life. Right. And that's what you've done. Right. And that's exactly what you've done. And, I, you know, I want to talk about that a little bit, but I know there's a lot of listeners on the show that I want to, I want to ask a question real quick. Uh, you know, it, after hearing, you know, a number of stories about transitioning from a W-2 into full-time investing or even becoming a full-time entrepreneur, right? The one of the themes is, you know, go into a full throttle, you know, burn the boat, sink the ships, go all in, baby, don't look back, you know, that kind of thing. You've made the transition, you went all in because you were fed up, right? Uh, and I think I might know the answer to this already, but what's your opinion on that philosophy of burning the boats, going all in? Do you subscribe to this thought process, uh, you know, when you're making that transition, just for other people who are considering this? Yeah, I think it's silly <laughs> in hindsight, right? Like if I had to face my worst fear. And so doing it that way forced me to touch the bottom of the pool. And I realized how deep the pool was. Mm. And now that I've been down to the bottom of the pool, I'm not scared. But for most people, if you don't have a year's worth of expenses in your savings account, if you don't have other options or the belief that if I go try this and it doesn't work, I can always go back and get a job. If you you don't have those beliefs, then it's not going to work, right? It's, it's not like I was a teacher and I was making $50,000 a year and I could replace that income in very short order. It took real time and then I did kind of the silliest thing by picking real estate as the way to exit because of how long it takes to actually get to real revenue when you're fixing and flipping. So again, I, I do think it's silly if you don't have a plan, mm. right? I didn't have a solid, I didn't have a solid plan. I didn't have counsel, right? I had opinions around me. And the favorite question that you get when you say, Hey, I'm going to go be a full-time entrepreneur is, well, how are you going to get health insurance? Yeah. It doesn't matter. <laughs> your mom or your dad's always going to ask that question. And your spouse, if you have one, and is going to look at you and say, well, how are we going to eat? Especially if you're the breadwinner. And so for people who want to make that exit, we've got this 15 point checklist that people can check okay. to do it smarter than what I did. If you burn the boats and you haven't done these things, you're going to have a really bumpy landing. And I can tell you from experience, it's no fun. Right. I, I remember thinking, oh, well, I'll, I can do this consulting thing and then I can do real estate and then I can do this and I can do that. And then people are confused about what you actually do. Mm. And if you haven't actually started to transition your identity before you make the leap, people are going to be baffled by the fact that now I'm an expert that does this thing. You know, I was the guy that was running an engineering organization. I wasn't the apartment operator. So why does that matter, Jerome? I assume your listeners like the real estate thing. Let's assume, assume they want to buy apartments. Well, why would I give you money if you're trying something that you haven't done before? 
Smart capital is not going to do that. They want people <laughs> who've got a proven track record. And sure. who's smart money? The bank is one, right? Mm-hmm. I told you my story about them all telling me that we don't care about those credentials. We want true experience. And so burning the boats is silly unless you have a plan or somebody that's in the car with you while you do driver's ed to help you not run into the back of people, check your blind spots, learn how to merge, and then actually find a way to monetize because lots of us are not in sales. And if you can't sell and you got a business and you don't hire a salesperson, you ain't got a business. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> you're, you're spot on, man. You're going to be real trouble, you know? And, and, you know, and I think that's a great point, man. And you bring up a lot of good stuff there. And, you know, you kind of mentioned, you know, you're running a, an engineering department and then, you know, transitioning into multifamily people are like, what are you doing? Right. But, you know, and it's the same thing, kind of what you're bringing up is, you know, if you don't have sales experience, how are you going to run a business? Right. Cause like I said, you're not even going to have a business. So with that in mind, you know, you and I have something in common and we talked a little bit about before the show is that we both have an engineering background, right? You mentioned you were running an engineering department. Uh, and it's very interesting because something I've noticed since entering, entering, the real estate investing scene, uh, particularly the commercial real estate investing, is that there are a lot of people with engineering backgrounds in the space, right? I mean, it's it's pretty incredible, really. I found quite a few that I've spoken with. Have you found this to be the case in your experience as well? Yeah, I think the best operators either have a sales background or a business back, or I'm sorry, engineering background. And you need both, right? Especially right. if you're syndicating. You need somebody who can actually do the problem solving and use the math to help guide decisions. You need somebody who knows how to sell or market so that you can get investors in the door. So, so really what is it you think about, you know, the engineers, you know, why they tend to fit in this space? Is it their background? Is it the education? What gives them certain skills to thrive in commercial real estate? Yeah. So regardless of your engineering degree, at some point, during your tenure, you had to make assumptions about what was going to happen in order to be able to write an equation to solve a problem, right? And if you're going to make money in commercial real estate, you've got to increase the net operating income. Where are the two variables for net operating income? Income and expenses. Okay, how can I change the income? Well, you can raise the rent. You can charge rent for things that you weren't charging rent for. And who knows what else you can come up with? People get pretty creative. And then the expenses, right? How can we be more efficient with the way that we're running this thing? Sometimes you're trading commodities out. Other times you're performing the task in a different way. And I think engineers are looking for those efficiencies. They're naturally wired to solve those problems. I think, and sometimes it's to a fault, right? But at the other end of the spectrum, if you can dial it in at the appropriate level, you can get to an optimal operating situation, which will maximize the income of the property. The other thing that I think engineers really bring to it is the fact that they're problem solvers, right? Mm -hmm. They're naturally wired to look for things that are wrong and figure out how to fix them. And probably the final thing, and I probably should have listed it earlier, but I think it's really valuable is they're not scared of the math. (laughs) you're buying a business. You need to look at the profit and loss statement. You need to understand which numbers are out of tolerance. Let's use the engineering word, Mm, right? Out of tolerance. And then figure out, well, what do we need to do in order to get it in tolerance? And let's talk to the accountants about the thing. And then let's visualize the data so that we can see a graph and see how we're performing. And what else can we do with this stuff to give us an indication on how to make a decision instead of the gut? Because at the end of the day, there's nothing emotional about the business that we're in unless we're working on the sales piece of getting investors into the deal. This is all logic. If you're going to be a great operator, you can't be upset or scared when something goes wrong. It's part of it. And so what does the data say? What, what should we do based on the numbers? And I think that's something that's unique to the robotic engineers that have been churned out of the system. 
<laughs> it's it's funny you bring that up, man, because, you know, I think engineers, they can get a bad rap at times. You know, mo- most are known for being, you know, good with math or spreadsheets or attention to detail, you know, having that analytical mind. Right. And that and that's basically about it. Right. And so but it really this isn't the case with all engineers. Right. Someone with an engineering background, uh, they might not really be strong in those areas. And really, maybe they're better suited being sales, kind of what you're saying before. You know, it, that might be the case. Uh, and then you have the triple threat, right? Somebody who's good at all the engineering stuff and is a salesperson, right? I mean, unstoppable, right? That's kind of just like the trifecta right there. But uh, you know, that really that really goes to whether you're an engineer or not, just just a person in general, what happens to their skill set. But you know, um, we all run into challenges, whether it's we don't have this skill set or you know, whatever we're lacking here, we're better here, but not here. And then we all run into challenges every once in a while. And that can be that goes the same with investing, right? Especially when we're starting out. Uh, there are a lot of challenges to overcome, right? Um, whether it be, I don't know this, or I don't know this person, or I don't know how to do this, whatever. Uh, but you find that out really quickly, especially when you're starting out. Did You know, when you started investing, was this the case for you? You know, did you find yourself, I know you mentioned a lot of challenges with the bank and stuff like that, but once you started rolling, uh, did you find like, you know, these challenges that, that keep coming up, how do I overcome them? Was that Was that the case with you? Yeah. And it's funny because I think every investor is trying to overcome four challenges and it's okay. the same four challenges, whether you've got one unit or $1 billion in assets under management is knowledge, deal flow, experience, and capital. And I think you have to solve them in that order. And people argue with me all the time and I still come back to the same formula. And I think I'm proved correct a lot of the time. Right. So let's break it down. Right. Knowledge. If I would have actually taken the time to get some education, I would have known what the bank wanted. If I would have taken some time to get some education, I would have known that the 54 page business plan that I put together wasn't worth anything because my assumptions were not appropriate. And I didn't spend any time talking to a property manager to validate what it actually costs to run the building. I would have known that the way that it was presented, it wasn't a deal. And, you know, LoopNet isn't the place that deals go to die. You have to negotiate the deals that are on LoopNet because everybody else passed on them or that were, you know, saw it when it was a broker's pocket listing. So I I would have been a whole lot smarter there. So and the knowledge is applied against leads to find deals. Leads and deals have the same letters, but they're not the same thing. Right. And so a deal is something where you actually have the opportunity to make money. A lead is something where if you buy, you're not going to make any money. It's guaranteed that you're going to fail. So we want to use the knowledge to find deals. And then once you actually have a deal, you need to take that to an experienced partner. You need to take that to an operator, somebody who's done what you want to do with that deal. Uh, How do you know that, Jerome? Well, because the 10 banks told me that when I was trying to get started and that's how I got my first deal done. Okay, next question, right? But experienced people don't like spending a bunch of time looking for deals. And so the value prop is that you've got a deal that actually makes sense and you can explain it and speak to them in an articulate way because you actually know the multifamily vernacular because you got some knowledge, right? And then the final piece is the capital, right? People think they're just going to go buy a widget. Well, uh, this isn't buying a widget. You got to operate the business. And again, you want to drive that net operating income. Well, how, how do they know that you're going to be able to drive the net operating income? Well, you've got to have experience. Oh, so I needed that person in order to get the big check. I, I don't care about the 20% or 25% of the risk money, right? The money that we raise in order to do the deal. Let's talk about the partner who's writing a check for 70 to 80% of the deal. What do they want? Let's satisfy their criteria, then worry about Mm -hmm. the other money. And you're not going to get that money without the experience partner. So we want to take that experience partner with a great deal to get the best funding. And so that's why we worry about capital last. Does it take a long time to cultivate investor relationships? Sure, it does. But do you need their money, which I consider a commodity before you have a deal? You do not. In fact, having a deal, having money or having experience without a deal is, is useless. 
Yeah, that's, that's a great point. And honestly, I'm, I, I love the way you broke that down, man, because it, it clarifies exactly what you need to do as an investor, right? And what, what's needed through the whole step of the process. And just being able to look at it broken down in that way it is makes it completely clear, at least for me, right? And I know a lot of listeners will probably feel the same way because there could be some confusion in there, right? Like, you know, what do I really need to focus on? And really in the order of importance that you put it into makes complete sense. And I love the fact that you've broken it down that way. So Thank you for diving into that. Um, my man, before we're out of time, I got to ask you one more question. And I, I, I got to make sure I ask this one. So again, I see you on social media all over the place, right? You're out there performing uh, you know, at a high level. And it seems like you're really, truly enjoying life, man, and getting the most out of it. You know, you've made this huge transition. You're doing your own thing now, man. You're loving life, man. So What's the secret? You know, how are you able to design the life you wanted and then execute successfully on that plan, man? What's the secret? Yeah, I feel bad calling it a secret because I want everybody to do it, right? But a lot of times you'll see me running around in this shirt that says I took the red pill. Mm-hmm. And the red pill is our model for a centered life. It's got six levels. And I think anybody who takes the red pill is going to be able to actualize their wildest dreams. And so what are the levels, Jerome? Well, it's self-image, relationship, work, health, prosperity, and significance. Right? Okay. Well, that's not an acronym. Like, (laughs) how am I going to remember that? Well, you got to take the red pill. So everything starts with you. Change starts within and then radiates out. So let's work on your self-image. Can you keep promises to yourself? If not then you're not going to be very happy with your life. Okay. Well, why do I need to keep promising myself and be happy with my life? Well, you don't have to, but let's say you do. That will allow you to hold other people accountable because you're an accountable person to yourself. Well, why does that matter? Well, the relationships that you have, especially if you're a top performer, are usually one way. Right. People come and take things from you. They're not coming. Danny, how are you doing? You you pick up your phone, Danny. You can scroll for a while. You probably don't have anybody just checking to see how you're doing. Maybe somebody (laughs) that loves you. But outside of that, you're probably not going to find that in your messages. But that's what we want. We want to have those mutually beneficial relationships because anything outside of that is inherently unhealthy. Right. Mm -hmm. Call I call that viruses. I call that parasites. And so there's three lumps that people can fit into one where it's mutually beneficial one where it's not mutually beneficial today but can be reframed and so we can work on those relationships set the boundaries change the expectations so that they move over in the bucket of mutually beneficial and then there's those where they're never going to bring any value to you and do you really have the capacity to carry around folks who are not going to help benefit you there isn't a relationship that you can think of where that works long term anywhere Right. You, we just run out of energy. We run out of steam. And so the next level is work. And so once you figured out how to hold people accountable, well, that's going to attract people to you. You're an influencer. You're a leader. People want to be around you And what in the workplace. That usually means that your your sphere of influence or control expands. And usually that means your income goes up. I want you to make all you can while you're working there, right? So that you can have resources to invest in the new things. Those three things, Danny, are the sources of all our stress, right? That, and I've said it about 200 times. I'm ready for somebody to argue with me. Bring me an example of something that is stress that doesn't fit in that bucket. We want to reduce the stress. So that you stop doing the self-destructive habits. Jerome, I don't have any self-destructive habits. Anybody who said I need to take the edge off has self-destructive habits because I can guarantee you they're not going for a run when they say that. And they're probably not going to lift weights or meditating (laughs) or doing a breathing exercise or journaling or any of the praying, whatever the thing is. Right. It's probably something that's going to be negative to their body or their mind or their spirit. So we need to. Figure out how to reduce the stress so you don't need to take the edge off. I call it needing uppers to get into the thing and downers to get out of the thing. So we want to take care of the stress. And once we do that, then we can focus on health, right? Because you're not beating yourself up. From health, what's health, Jerome? I I, want to jump to prosperity, but what's health? Health is simply making sure that you're in that apex performer state, right? You're not beating yourself up. You're not undoing all of the good habits that you have that are making your life better. Maybe you're meditating, maybe you're journaling, maybe you're exercising, whatever the thing is, right? You're, you're doing that stuff so you can be your best self so that you can run the race as hard as you can run it and as fast as you can run it. 
Okay, so boom, we got the health. Now we move to prosperity. Jerome, why am I worried about prosperity after health? I need to get my prosperity first, then worry about the health. Well, if you know anybody, and most of us do, that has a ton of money or had a ton of money and they were sick, they gave up all their money in order to get healthy again. So why not just get the health up front and then deal with the prosperity later? I don't like for people to go backwards when they're hanging out with me. So we, we focus on prosperity at level five. Well, what is prosperity? It's abundance, right? It's overflow. We want to put our mask on first so that we can take care of other people. And so we get the prosperity going. And then this is that. And that's really where the multifamily fits in in our coaching mm-hmm. model, right? Because it's an opportunity to create that recurring income, a subscription model that I believe everybody should run their business off of. And then out of that abundance, out of that overflow, it's the ultimate level. It's significance. And this is the place where you get to positively impact the life of somebody who's using your time, talent, or treasures in it, or, or, and depending on how you want to put it together. And so what we want to do here is become immortal, right? We want to make an impact in somebody's pond that ripples to places that we can't see. And we see ourselves show up in a manner that we didn't expect because of interactions that we have with other people. And for me, one of those things was endowing a scholarship at my alma mater. So an engineering student for eternity will be able to go to school at that school that I went to and not worry about how they're going to pay tuition, books, room and board, that stuff. That was super exciting for me. I had that experience. I walked out of college with no debt. And so I know what that can do from somebody on somebody's financial path. The levels one through five. I call those self-actualization, right? When you actually achieve that abundance, that prosperity, you you probably dreamed of, but didn't know if you would ever attain. And then level six is transcendence, right? You've left yourself Mm -hmm. and went back and made a positive impact on the world. And so for me, this is working in significance. I learned so much from podcasts and YouTube videos when I was coming through and to be able to help compress timeframes for you, your listeners is my gift back to the community that gave so much to me. And so that's why I do these, not because I'm trying to market to people, but because I want to help people move along on their road. Man, man it's so powerful and i gotta be honest with you, i'm a little bit blown away how in-depth that is and how awesome it is really and i feel like we could probably have you know that whole section right there could have its own episode dedicated to it you know because we could dive so deep into that man there's so much there um so man i know our listeners are going to find out more about that man before we get out of here man i know we're running lo- we've already gone past the time but i feel like we can talk forever you know talk about i'm having such a great conversation here uh but before we do get out of here man uh Tell us more about Dreamcatchers, the Myers Development Group, your focus, anything more where our listeners can find out more about you and what you got going on, man, because it's, it's it's amazing. Yeah, man, I, I'd be most grateful if the listeners were kind enough. They're listening to a podcast right now. And, you know, if they could hit the subscribe button on Dreamcatchers and download some weekly inspiration, education and direction on their journey to living a life of their wildest dreams. We bring people on who figured out how to exit the matrix and we tell their story so that you can pick up some tidbits to get closer to whatever dream you're chasing. Cause we, we believe that you should be a catcher, man. And so we want people to catch your dreams and we want to give them some of the, the tools that they need in order to do that. And, you know, I, I always do one call to action. So if your listeners be willing to do that for me, I, that would be so amazing. I, I'd be deeply appreciative of it. Absolutely. We're going to make sure to put the link to that in the show notes so our listeners can find out more about that. If they're not already, I'm sure most, a lot of our listeners are probably already familiar with you, but just in case we're going to make to put up, make sure to put all that stuff in the show notes. Is there a the best way for them to be able to reach out to you, connect with you and actually, you know, um, do, you know, find out more about anything else you have going on? Yeah. I mean, Jerome Myers.co is the website where you can find everything out that you want to find out. You can't find out about coaching. I don't advertise that. It's only for a very small group of people, but yeah, you you can see all of our other offerings and I, we give so much value away. I, I just, the goal here is just to serve people in, in the best way that we can. 
awesome drum. We're going to make sure to put all the stuff in the show notes so our listeners can find it and uh, they can, you know, check into all your stuff, man. It, it's been an awesome conversation, man. Like I said, I feel like we can keep going on with this conversation, uh, but uh, I definitely want to be respectful of your time. So Jerome, thank you uh, for coming on the show today. I really appreciate you taking the time to speak with me. Danny, sorry for blabbering so much, man. Just thanks for having me on. Hey, thanks for listening to today's episode. Head over to iTunes to subscribe to the show. And while you're there, we really appreciate you leaving a rating and written review. If you have any questions or topics you'd like to hear on the show, connect with us on social media or through our website at twosmartassets.com. We look forward to speaking to each and every one of you. Talk to you soon.